the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Commissioners. And good afternoon to you, Madam Witness. Welcome to the TRRC. As you already know, my name is Maria Masingate, and I will be leading you on behalf of the Commission today. Yeah. For a start, I would just like you to assume a comfortable situation, and maybe you could draw the chair in so that you feel comfortable. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to avoid our speeches overlapping, I'll advise that you wait for three seconds when I ask a question before you answer it, and I'll do the same as well. And if you do not understand a particular question, just let me know, and I'll repeat the question, and I'll, or I will explain it to you better. Okay. So for today, we're going to discuss the incident of April 10, with respect to your late husband, and the impact it has had on you and your family. It will just be like a brief session, mm -hmm. maybe an hour or more. So if you feel that you have to take a break, do let me know. Okay. Thank you. Can you please tell us your name? My name is Awasane. When and where were you born? I was born in, in Dipakunda in 1979. Can you please give us a brief history of your educational background that's from primary to secondary with dates, if you remember them? Okay. I attended Bakote Primary School from 1986 to 1991 then to SOS Haman Minor Junior School from 1992 to 1995, then Muslim Senior Secondary School from 1995 to 1998. What is your current occupation? I'm currently working at Gamtel as a uh, corporate account manager. Can you tell us immediately after your secondary education what you did? I got married. To whom did you get married to? I got married to the late Omar Barrow. When was this? In October 1998, the same year I finished my secondary school. Can you please just tell us briefly who Omar Barrow was as a person? Okay. Omar Barrow was a very good person. He was so kind, a caring husband, a good son, a very good person. He was jovial, always playing with everybody, a very hard-working person, person. Yeah. Can you please tell us what his occupation was? He was working as a journalist at the Sud FM, Banjo, and uh, at the same time a Red Cross volunteer. For well, how long were you married to Omar Barrow? We, are, we were married for one year, six months before his death. Can you please tell us the circumstances surrounding his death? Yeah, it was on on the 10th of April, Monday morning, he told me that he was going to Red Cross then because there was a, students were going to do a peaceful demonstration. Uh, and he was part of the emergency response team of the Gambia Red Cross Society. And he was going there to do force aid, to render force aid service. Because normally when, uh, when events happen, the emergency response team of the Gamma Record Society will be there in anticipation of uh, anything, any happening. You mentioned that it was on the 10th of April, Monday morning. Yeah. Do you know what year that was? 
It was 2000. And you said that he got up in the morning and told you that he was going to the Red Cross. Was there anything that was happening on that particular day? Yes, he told me that students were doing a peaceful march. So as a Red Crosser, he will be there with his colleagues to go because normally where there is gathering, they will always be there in case of any emergency. Just to get um, a perspective of how young you were when this incident happened, can you please tell us how old you were when you were married to Omar Barrow? I was 20 years. So when he told you that he was going to the Red Cross to volunteer, can you tell us what happened? Yeah, when, when he went, I, I see him off to work. Then I continue with my, my normal activities at home. So I wanted to go to the market. Immediately I came out of our compound. I was going to the market to come and cook lunch. Then I saw a lady who was living opposite our compound. She asked me where I was going, and I told her I was going to the market. She told me that there was nobody in the market, that no one was selling that day, everybody is gone home because of the student demonstration that was taking place. At that point, did you know how serious this demonstration was? At that point, I didn't know how serious, uh, serious it was. I was just seeing people who were passing by. But I don't know, I didn't, I didn't know how serious it was by then. Did the lady give you any other information apart from the fact that there was no one at the market? No, she didn't. When she told me, I went back to the compound and told my mother-in-law that the lady said that no one was at the market and I was supposed to go and um, come and cook lunch. So she asked me to give her the money. There was a small market behind our um, compound called Marsebundau, small market. She asked me to give her the money, then she will go and buy uh, the things I need for my cooking. Where were you residing at that time? We were residing at Latikuna Jaman, just near the uh, mosque, Latikuna Mosque. You've told us that you were 22 years old at that time. Mm. How about your husband? How old was he? He was 25 when he was killed. After your mother-in-law went to the market for you, can you please tell us what happened? Yes, yeah, she went to the market. I waited for her. When, after her return, she was looking very sad by looking at her face. So I asked her what, what happened. She said, um, our, the, the, today, the, how things are going today, I'm very afraid. I asked her why. She said, because I saw the students, they are carrying the army commander, Babu Kajata, on the highway. I don't think there, there, there will be peace today. That's what she explained to me. When she told you that, at that time you knew that your husband was outside, did anything come to your mind at that point? No, nothing came to my mind at that time because knowing my husband, he was very active at that time. He was very active. Well, nothing happened to him. So I didn't even think about him that, at that time because he was, I know he was a Red Cross volunteer and he was a very active member of the Red Cross volunteer. You've also told us that your husband was a journalist as well. Do you know when he went out that morning, whether he was acting in both his capacity as a Red, Red Cross volunteer and as a journalist, or he was only there as a volunteer? Well, I, I didn't know, but I was told that during the, the at that time, he had a small notepad with him. Sometimes he'll be writing. That, that, that was what I was told, but I don't know what he was writing. Can you please tell us how he was dressed that day? Yeah, he was dressed in a long trousers and shirt, and blue shirt. 
Can you please explain the events after you were informed of the disturbance outside? Can you repeat that question? Can you please tell us the events leading to that day? Yeah, then after that, when my mother-in-law came back, so I started cooking. Then people started coming to our compound. But we didn't know that he, he, he already died. We knew nothing. So people were coming, whoever came, and, and know, know that uh, we did not know, then the person will go back. The person will not say anything. So people were coming and going. People were coming and going. There, there was a time when my one of my aunties, who was staying at the Pakuna, came to see me. Came to the compound. So when I asked her, she said um, they told her about a house she wanted to rent just behind our compound. She came to check on that house. So I asked her whether she got the house. She said no, not knowing that she already knew the death of my husband. But when she came, she found out that I did not know. She can't tell me. Then she went back. It was like that until around 2, 2 p.m. At what time in the morning did your husband leave the house? He left around 8.30 in the morning. So till around 2 p.m. you did not know his whereabouts? No. Can you tell us what happened next? Then uh, around two, a lady came who was um, he, she, um, she was an auntie to my husband. She was just staying around our house. She came to the house because she knew about it that her son was working at the police station. So the son called her to inform her Omar's, about Omar's death. So she came to the house to inform my mother-in-law. When they came, she came with her two daughters. I was carrying my five months old baby. Then one of the daughters came and took the baby away from me. Then they entered the house. Immediately they entered, I heard screams. They were crying. So I went to find out what the problem was. And I, my mother-in-law told me, they killed my son. I, I asked her, which son? She said, they killed. Our they killed Pa Omar. That's my husband. So I told her, Pa Omar, no, that is not possible. Pa Omar cannot die. He's not dead. That's not true. I, I, I went with him until uh, when he was going to walk, I went with him until outside. He cannot die. Just like that. It's not true. Did you eventually confirm? Did you eventually confirm what they were saying? Yeah, just uh, a while later, there and then, um, two, um, two people from the Gambia Red Cross, they were his colleagues, they came. Immediately they entered, I, 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 scold, I scolded one of them. I asked him, tell me, what's happening with my husband? Is Omar dead? He told me, no, Omar is not dead, just calm down. It's true that they shot him. But right now he's in the theater. They are operating on him. At around 6 o'clock, I will call you. You will talk to him. Just calm down. We are going back. We just came to inform you about that. Then I told my mother-in-law that, you, you see, these people said he's not dead. He was shot, but he's not dead. He's at the theater having his operation. They, they, they will call me for me to talk to him. So that's how, that, then we were calm. The situation was calm, so people started coming, uh, asking whether what they had was true, that they had Omar Baro is dead. People were coming and going, coming and going. So when whoever come, I'll tell the person, they said he's not dead, he was shot. Other people who come, we cry. It's true, he's died. I saw he's dead. I saw him in the dead house with my eye. I saw him. People were coming. Some will say, he, I saw him, he's dead. I saw his body lifeless. Some will, some will say, I saw him when, when he was being carried by the ambulance. People will come saying different things. So we were there until around 6 o'clock. When I had um, horns of vehicles, because I was emotionally uh, imbalanced, so I just ran out. I went out to the, to the main road. 
Immediately I went outside, I saw fleet of, fleet of Red Cross cars from the Johnson up to our gate. Immediately I saw um, he, one of his colleagues, he was also uh, my, uh, a, a relation to me. I, 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 I scolded at him, I, I, I asked him, tell me, what's happening with Omar, is he dead? Then he, the moment he started telling me to take heart, that God is in control. Then I make a very loud scream and I pass out. I didn't know what was happening again. How did you feel at that point? I felt so devas devastated. I, I was confused. Everything was mixed up in my mind. I was very young, I don't understand. Imagining my husband dead Imagining me living without my husband, that was very, very emotional for me. That was too much for me. I felt so devastated. But more than that was the sense, sense of loss and grief that haunts me every day after his death. Knowing that um, I always wanted to be with him, but deep in, my, in me, I know that will never happen again. It was a real pain for me, very painful. Did you find out what led to his death? Yes, later we were told that he was shot. He was shot at the Red Cross headquarters, inside the Red Cross headquarters. You did share an old observer article dated the 11th of April 2000. I just need you to identify whether this is the article that you actually shared with me. Yeah, that's the article. Mr. Chairman, I would just like to read into the records the content of the newspaper article on the death of Omar Barrow. Please proceed. It's a daily newspaper dated the 11th of April 2000. And the title is Omar Barrow Killed. It's a press release that was issued by the Gambia Red Cross, and I quote verbatim from the article. Mr. Omar Barrow died at the Royal Victoria Hospital in Banjul. After all efforts to save his life, Omar Barrow was shot within the premises of the Gambia Red Cross whilst rendering humanitarian service during the student demonstration of Monday April 10, 2000. At the time of the gunshot, Mr. Omar Barrow was wearing a clearly marked protective Red Cross emblem, that is a Red Cross beep and helmet, which is in line with International Code of Conduct in Relief Operation and in conformity with Geneva Convention. Mr. Omar Barrow is a member of the Gambia Red Cross Society Emergency Response Team and the Resource Development Committee. Mr. Barrow, a very active and dedicated Red Cross volunteer, died in the line of duty. The entire membership of the Red Cross, Gambia Red Cross Society will observe a week of mourning for the late Omar Barrow, effectively the tent of April 2000, and all, all in ceremonial uniform or Red Cross t-shirts. The Red Cross said it extends condolence to the family and friends of Omar Barrow. The late Barrow is survived by a wife and a seven-month-old baby girl. That is the end of the article, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to put this in exhibit as exhibit 
0079. Uh, request granted. I'll just ask for the questions as the observer is passed on to the commissioners to take a look. Just as you have told us, reading from the article, your late husband was shot right in the premise of the Gambia Red Cross Society. Yes. How did you feel knowing that he was shot helping other people? Well, I felt very sad and devastated because as a humanitarian worker who is, who is surrendering service to the um, to other victims and casualties, wearing the Red Cross emblem inside the Red Cross premises and was killed, I cannot imagine that could ever happen. Did you get the chance to see his body after he was shot? Yes, on the third day, that was on, on the 12th of April, I went to the dead house. Before, that's the day he was supposed to be buried. So I went to the dead house to see, pay my respect. Can you please tell us the condition of his body when you saw him? Yes, when I entered, his face was turning the face was facing the wall of the dead house. Then he was turned to face me. When I when he when they turned his head, I saw oozes of blood outside from his mouth, and the shirt he was wearing was blood stains all over. At that point, when you saw him lying there helplessly, how did you feel? I couldn't imagine it. He was at the last floor. I had to bend. I couldn't even stand up again. Madam Sane, can you please just take a sip of water? Just take your time. We'll be waiting for you. I just want to apologize for making you relieve this moment all it's over okay. again. I'm sure it's a, it is indeed a painful process for you. The Daily Observer article I read stated that um, your baby was seven months old. And you told us that um, your baby was five months old. Which is which? Can you please verify that? I think that was a mistake from them. My baby was five five years old. She was five years old on the day his dad Months, was, right? Sorry. Um, she was five months old on the day, uh, old when his, the day his father was buried. Thank you very much for that clarification. Having lost your husband at that tender age, can you tell us what impact that has had on you? It has a very negative impact to me because it was not easy. I was, I was not, I was a housewife. I was not working at the time. I was very young. My husband died, left, left, leaving me with a child, a baby. Thinking about the challenges ahead of me in taking care of my baby was too much. The family was there to support me, but 
due to their financial condition, they cannot support me. So I have to take care of my baby alone. Then I had, I had to find a job to be able to take care of me and my baby at the time. I will come back to that. I just want to take you back a little bit. Um, you told us that your husband was at the mortuary. Do you know if any document was prepared with respect to his death? Yeah, we were issued a death certificate. And uh, you had in fact shared that death certificate with me. I just want you to identify the death certificate so that I can put it in exit. Yes, that's the death certificate. Mr. Chairman, um, this is a death certificate with respect to Omar Barrow. I will want to put it in exhibit as well. The first one will be 0079. This will be 0080. A request granted. You've told us about the impact of uh, your late husband on yourself. Can you please tell us the impact on his family as well? Yes, the, the family also suffered because he was the breadwinner of the family. He was the only person person working at the time because his siblings were all going to school so he was taking care of everybody and the, the, the father was not very strong. he was taking care of the family and after his death it was a great loss for everybody yeah it was not easy for them do you know if his death had any emotional effect on his parents yes it does because he was the one taking care of all of them and after he is dead things we are very tough with them things we are not easy and um, his father think about that until he even also died he died after two, two years after Omar's death and after that also things became even more worse because there was nobody to help them you mentioned that Omar Barrow was the only one walking in his, among his father's children yes. and the others were going to school. Mm -hmm. Can you please um, tell us what grade they were in when their brother passed away? I couldn't remember, but the younger one, before. I couldn't remember what, what grades they were going. That's okay. But they were very young at the time. It's understandable. Was he the first son of his father then? He, he was not the first son, but he was the one who, who, who was responsible for the family because the first son was not working either and he was not staying there. You mentioned that your child was five months old yeah. when uh, the father died. Given that particular age and not having a father in her life, can you please tell us how that impacted her life while growing up? Well, it, it was not easy. Growing up without a father was a very difficult moment, but thanks to his uncles, his father's brothers that he didn't, she didn't felt that much. With the help of his uncle, fam, uh, paternal family and my help, he, she was coping. During this time, did you receive any help from the government? 
No, I didn't receive any help. Was anything done about your husband's death? Nothing was done. Do you know if they identified the people that shot your husband? Not to my knowledge, till now. How do you feel, like, knowing that your husband passed, was shot during a student demonstration and nothing was done about it? I, I feel very bad, very bad indeed, because killing somebody's loved one who was taking care of everybody, who was the breadwinner to the family, killing that person was a great loss for the family and nothing was ever done. No assistance from the government, no justice, nothing. You've told us a little bit about the impact of all of these on the family and on the child as well. How about you? How were you coping emotionally with all of this? I was emotionally devastated. At that time, I, I didn't even think of uh, getting another man in my life because of the sense of loss I had, the, the grief, the sorrow I had in me. I was very young at the time. It haunts me a lot. I, I even used to ha have nightmares. I will, I will sleep at night, until night, I will open my door, I will go and sit outside alone in the dark. Very confused. I don't know what to do. It was a great loss for me. The five-month-old baby, how old is she now? She's 19 years old now. And can you tell us if she is in school right now? Yes, he just started going to the University of the Gambia. I must congratulate you on that. Having struggled all by yourself, you raised a young, intelligent lady that is striving towards excellence. Congratulations to you. Thank you. And you've also told us that um, you now have a job at Gamtel. Yes. I just wanted to know if you went back to school or how did you manage to cope? No, I didn't go back to school. But you know, before Omar died, that was January 2000, I wanted to do business management. I wanted to study business management at, at the G, um, MDI. So he advised me to, to first do um, computer software. So he paid for me. I started doing computer at, G, at GTMI, Gamtel School, GTMI. I, and he died immediately. I finished doing the foundation level. I stopped. Then when I um, started working at, I first worked at the Red Cross for four years. Then after I went, I proceeded to Gamtel. So when I went to Gamtel, I did some courses there. I did ICT there, and I did CIA business studies up to advanced diploma level. That's, those are the only courses I did. That is very commendable. Um, you not only raised a young lady that is striving towards excellence, you yourself got up, dusted yourself, and then you built up your life again. Congratulations to you as well. Thank you. And thank you very much for answering all of my questions today. Thank you. I must apologize once again for making you relieve that sorrowful moment. It's okay. Mr. Chairman, back to you. Thank you very much, Ma, a Council, and thank you very much, Ms. Masane. Uh, we all share your pain uh, to lose a, uh, a loved one at a very tender age that you did. We left with a child, and we echo counsel in congratulating you Thank in you. seeing that daughter through to university. 
that's a quite an achievement. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry about uh, the loss. We share the pain. Uh, commissioners, if you have any questions, please come. Yes, Imam C, you have the floor. How are you? What was, what was the name of your child? Thank you, Imam C. Uh, Commissioner Carr, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chairman. I just want to find out how is she funding her education at the university? I'm doing, I'm still struggling. Even, even now, I'm owing areas for last semester, and she's starting the second semester. I'm still struggling with her education. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. If there are no further questions, do you have any concluding remarks I'm about to make? Yes, Sane. If you do, please. I'll proceed. Thank you. Um, I'm you. Um. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, and all TRC staff. I have a very short remarks to make. First and foremost, I would like to show my thanks and appreciation to the TRRC for the opportunity to talk about my late husband's tragic death. Omar was not only a good person, but a caring, hardworking, and ambitious parent who loved his work and his family as well. He died of humanity and died on duty while serving humanity. He never participated directly in the demonstration, but joined his colleagues and members of the emergency response team of the Gambia Red Cross Society in rendering force aid and ambulance service when he was shot and killed in cold blood. I thank the Red Cross both locally and internationally, my parents and my, my then-in-laws, my family and my neighborhood for the support they gave to me during those difficult times. On my path, I didn't know the reasons why they killed my husband. However, I would recommend a thorough investigation on my husband's killing and train the security personnel, particularly, particularly the police intervention unit on how to con control crowd and provide better hum protection for humanitarian workers, particularly those at the Red Cross. May the soul of my husband and all departed souls continue to rest in peace. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much indeed um, uh, for those wise words. Um, we don't have any further uh, proceeding, any for the items um, to take up. We will meet again tomorrow at um, uh, 10 o'clock. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.